Welcome to another exciting new episode of <laughs> Talking About Stoicism. Now, um, <clears throat> today I thought we would go back to Seneca. We've we've made some excursions to other things in the past weeks, but we are still trying to get through the 120, what is it? 24. 124 letters, yes, and this is letter 86 where we have landed. This is a fairly personal letter, uh, which I always think is interesting. It's interesting to see Seneca write to his friend uh, and and see how it's not that different from how we would write to a friend these days. So in this case, I'm, I'm not going to write, read you the whole letter as it is fairly long. I'll read you the first bit and then I'll read you a little bit from the middle. From Seneca to Lucilia's greetings, I write this to you from lodgings right inside the villa of Scipio Africanus, having already paid my respects to the great man's shade and to the altar, which I suspect is also his tomb. His spirit has surely returned to heaven from which it came, I believe that not because he led great armies, for even Cambyses had those, and he was insane and took advantage of his insanity, but because of his exceptional self-control and his patriotism, which in my view was even more admirable after he left his homeland than when he was defending it. Scipio Africanus, famous Roman general. So you have to have that, that context. Okay, now he, he goes on to describe Scipio's villa. And bear in mind, the Romans were nothing if not adverse to luxury, right? And here I find it very interesting. So he says, um, for example, he's talking about how this bathhouse, sorry, how this villa is actually not that luxurious. And then he says here, for example, in Scipio's bathhouse, the windows are tiny, mere slits cut into the stone wall so as to admit light without making the building less defensible. But nowadays they refer to bath buildings as moth holes if they are not designed to take in the sunshine at all hours of the day through large windows. If one cannot get a suntan there along with one's bath, if one does not have a view from one's tub of the countryside and of the sea. For that reason, baths that drew admiring crowds at the time of their dedication are despised as outmoded the moment self-indulgent devises some new means of outdoing itself. In the old ways, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. In the old days, there were only a few bathhouses, and they had no kind of decor. Why decorate a building when the admission is only a farthing, and the purpose is utility, not amusement? There were no water jets below the surface, no constant supply of fresh water, as if from a hot spring, and no one cared whether the water that washed away dirt and grime was crystal clear. And yet, in all truth, how delightful is it is to enter those dark bathhouses with a plain stucco, when you know that the uh, aid I can never say this word. Aidly, a a a a a dial, aidly. Yes, I'm gonna go with aidly. Um, who felt the water temperature with his own hand adjusted it for you with Cato or Fabius Maximus or one of the Cornelii, um, etc. So, here's what I find interesting about this chapter. Seneca himself, as I've said a number of times, was very rich. He was very rich. He was sort of the, the, the Roman equivalent of being an investment banker. He had a lot of money. He had multiple properties, uh, he, uh, he lived in luxury, and of course his life wasn't all easy either. He worked for Nero, he was banished twice, he, he did all kinds of things, he was forced to commit suicide at some point, so I mean, he, he, it's all very, very tragic. But what I'm trying to get at today is he was certainly no stranger to luxury. Now he goes to the villa of a great Roman jump great Roman general, sorry, revered by many. And he is a little surprised that that guy's villa is devoid of accoutrement, is not beautifully done, is very, for lack of a better term, Spartan, is very utilitarian. It's not luxurious, in other words. And what I find interesting about that is I can certainly picture a soldier having a house 
looking at that house as, but can I defend this? Let's not make the windows too big. Let's make the wall pretty thick, like these kinds of things. Seneca was not really a soldier. He was, at best you could say, a politician, um, an, an advisor to, to emperors. And what I find interesting from the viewpoint of Stoicism in this particular letter is, can you go without luxury? Stoicism is a hard philosophy, a philosophy that asks us to continuously stri uh, strive to improve ourselves, but also continuously be able to face hardships as well as we can. That's the whole point, right? It's not a good weather philosophy that's only meant to be there when life is easy. It's a philosophy that is meant to help you through difficult periods in your life. Now, it is remarkable how accustomed we got in, and I, I use this term broadly, but in the West to certain luxuries. We are used to being able to run a tap or faucet and water comes out. And you can, nine out of ten times, but you can drink that water. We're accustomed to be able to go to any grocery store, which is typically not more than 10 or 15 minutes away from where we live, and we can get food there. And I think because of that, we forget about certain hardships. This is not to say you've never had hardships in your life, but it is to say that we take an awful lot of things for granted. We take for granted that if I'm thirsty and I, I have no soda, soft drinks, pot, whatever in my fridge, I could just open the tap and I can drink water and it's clean and it will not make me sick. If I'm hungry, I can walk or drive or cycle or whatever to the grocery store and I can get food, anything I like. One of my favorite things, favorite thing, this was a little bit of a thing in the Netherlands, but it's much more pronounced in North America, is I love looking at the frozen pizza aisle in a grocery store. Because there is a ridiculous amount of choice there. If, if, if you're in North America, do, do it. Look at all the brands and different kinds, and God forbid, pineapple on pizza. Anyway... What I'm trying to say is, we got used to that. And one thing Seneca did that I've mentioned before, but one thing Seneca did was also put himself through hardship once in a while. And I've also criticized that a little bit in the past. Of He would sleep on a, on a very hard bed and would only eat bread and some, drink some water during the day. And I do think that's admirable. I also think that's not that great a challenge if you're also pretty much a millionaire. But having said that, the practice is an interesting one. And it's something that, that, that I always keep thinking about of what, what do you really need to be happy? And I know that this is a very grand thing to say, but we've accustomed to so many things. Can we be happy without those things? Well, probably being happy without clean drinking water is very difficult because in three days you'll die. But having said that, I think you know what I mean. We're accustomed to all these luxuries. I had a conversation a couple of months ago with a colleague who uh, uh, went to school in Africa, and and he described how uh, they would the, the the kids in in school, young kids uh, would would be beaten if if they were not in school in time, and the teachers would not take into account that school might start at seven thirty. And some of these kids would have to walk 20 kilometers to get to school. Would first have to go somewhere and, and, and get water and then bring that back home and then walk all the way to school, 20 kilometers. Imagine if you were five, six, seven years old, you'd have to walk 20 kilometers to get to school. This is another thing that we accept, that, that's not, that we, we don't have to do that because in, in my country, kids typically cycle to school. They can take a bus. In North America, there are school buses that pick kids up and, and drop them off at school. We're used to those kinds of things. We're used to having the, the, the safety of, I mean, I know that's a relative thing, but I mean, we have relative safety. A kid can go to school and probably will be fine. 
We can go to the grocery store. We can do all these things. So what I'm trying to say is, have you also thought about what it would be like if you would not have these things? And for me, it was an eye-opening event. Really, an eye-opening event was when the whole pandemic started. And initially, I had this feeling of it's not going to be that bad. It can't be that bad. I remember going to the supermarket and seeing empty shelves. Empty shelves. Not, not, there was some stuff. No, no. Empty shelves. There was nothing, not a single thing on the shelves. All dried pasta, gone. All flour, gone. All sugar, gone. All these kinds of things, gone. For the first time in my life, I said, I'd never seen that. I'd never seen empty shelves like that. I lived in an area, I grew up in an area where there, was, there, were, there were floods once in a while. Um, and, and sometimes the military would come and they would, they would put sandbags out. And you would see soldiers walking down the street to help the people. But I don't recall seeing completely emptied shelves. So how do you deal with this? Well, in that case, I comforted myself with the idea of, well, there's probably a bit of a rush. I think it's going to be okay. It was okay. It took a couple days, then everything was okay. I'm not I'm not making light of the pandemic, but I mean, just the, the, being able to get groceries was okay. But it's very difficult. It's very difficult to be confronted with that, and it's difficult for us because we're not used to it anymore. And in some countries, people are very used to that. But there's a good chance that if you're watching this, you're not in one of those countries. It's an interesting thing to think about. And the, the stoic lesson for me for today is think back to what that was like, or if you've not experienced that, think back to how would you handle it if this were to happen? If the world does start to deteriorate further. <laughs> <clears throat> and maybe one day the grocery shelves will be empty, will remain empty. What will you do? It's not to make you depressed. It's, but, but, but stoic practice is also thinking about the worst thing that can happen. And trying to think about how you will handle that. What will you do? How will you prepare yourself for such an event? Mentally, psychologically, emotionally. This is not doomsday stuff. and It's, 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 not, it's just a matter of... I think it is wise to once in a while think about that, and hopefully that kind of stuff will never happen. But if it does, if you've thought about how you will react to it, at that point it might be, relatively speaking, a little bit easier to react to it at that time. So, there you have it. Maybe a random thing to get out of that letter, but that's what, what kind of made me think let me know what you think about this kind of stuff and how you appreciate the luxuries we have because after that day in that grocery store i certainly started to appreciate some things a lot more in general but even now i think back to that once in a while there you have it i hope this was interesting let me know what you think Glad to see you again next time. More talk about stoicism. Bye.